Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. This is Susan Kaufman. I'm here with Attitude Magazine. It is our regular ADHD experts session, and today we are extremely pleased to have Susan Yellen, Esquire. She is an attorney and the director of the Advocacy and College Counseling Services at the Yellen Center for Mind, Brain, and Education. The Yellen Center is a very innovative learning support and diagnostic practice in New York City. Susan Yellen's authored a book, which sounds extremely interesting, called Life After High School, A Guide for Students with Disabilities and Their Families, and has extensive experience working with students with disabilities and advocating on their behalf. The topic that she's going to discuss today is one that we hear frequently from Attitude readers about, and that is IEPs versus 504 plans. Um, tremendous confusion out there about these plans and this legislation. Which one does your child need and how do you go about getting it? I think this is a topic that all of us um, are interested in. And Susan, uh, thank you so much again for being with us today. We're grateful for your time. You're very welcome. I'm looking forward to this. With that, let me turn it over to you. Okay. Let's start by being very clear that this is not an area where the laws are clear. If you're confused about an IEP versus a 504, welcome to the club. There are a lot of schools, a lot of parents, and a lot of professionals who are also confused. Both of these laws originated in the spirit of the civil rights movement when kids with disabilities were being excluded from schools simply because they had disabilities. But they've taken two different approaches. So first I'm going to look at each law, try to explain to you a little bit about how they work, and then we're going to go look at them together, see where they differ, and see how they might apply to your child and your situation, and how do you get them going? What are the practical aspects? So first, Let's look at an IEP. An IEP, and there's a whole alphabet soup here, and I do apologize, but that's just the way these laws work. An IEP is an individualized education program. It's created under a law called the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the IDEA. It is an education law. It applies to students from the preschool age until they graduate from high school with a regular diploma. It is, applies to students in public schools, and it applies to students in private schools. So it's, it's a law that goes with every student wherever they may, may be being educated, and students who are homeschooled can also take advantage of some of the uh, aspects of the IDEA. 504 is more of a civil rights law. It is a law that guarantees equal access to individuals with what they call handicaps. I hate these terms, by the way. And it's designed to eliminate discrimination on the basis of disability. But 504 is limited to those who are getting federal benefits. So it only applies to public school students. If your student is in a private school, your student cannot get 504 services. So that's real easy. That's sort of first thing you weigh when you're looking at these two laws. IDEA is a richer law. It goes on for pages and pages with very specific requirements for procedures, for who comes to meetings, for what do you do if you don't like what the school is doing. 504 is a much briefer, shorter law that simply says things like procedures should be established, whereas the IDEA would give you 10 pages of procedures. So they're very different, but they both, first of all, require that a student have a disability. Every student who is entitled to an IEP under the IDEA is also entitled to a 504 plan, but not vice versa. And as I said, the IDEA is for all students. 504 is only for students in public schools. What you need to remember is that the IDEA, the IEP process, has, is a two-step process. And it also has something called categories. The IEP 
applies to students who have one of, under federal law, it's 10 specific disabilities, and students who fall under the classification of one of those disabilities also must require special education or related services. Schools are required to provide IEPs or a 504 to every student who qualifies. Parents need to keep in mind, sometimes schools act as if they're doing you a favor. They are not doing you a favor. These are rights that belong to your child. And if the rights are, if your child is not provided with an opportunity to ha exercise these rights, they're being deprived of something that the law entitles them to, and there are remedies. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. Okay, as I was saying, to qualify an I for an IEP, first a student has to have one or more of a specific list of disabilities, things like um, specific learning disability. Um, students with ADHD would generally fall under the category of other health impaired, something we refer to as OHI. And because of that disability, as I was saying, they have to require special education or related services. To get a 504 plan, a student need only have a disability, not one of a specific list, so it can be any sort of disability. And the definition is very broad, just a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Learning is a major life activity. Attention is a major life activity. So both of those would be considered disabilities qualifying a student for a 504 plan. So for example, if a student has simply a medical condition, I know we're focusing on attention and learning here, but this is an easier example. If a student has allergies or asthma, has no learning problems, no attention problems, simply needs to get medication in school and simply needs to be in a classroom that's not going to trigger the asthma or the allergy, that student would be getting a 504 plan. They don't have anything that requires special education services. They simply need to have their medical needs addressed. That's the most common area that we find for 504. Things get a lot more complicated when we're dealing with students with learning and attention problems because often those can go either way. The other thing that's important to remember, if you recall I said that an IEP, the IDEA, is a richer law. Of the two, it's the only one that requires parental involvement. It's the only one that requires that parents consent to implement services. 504 can meet its requirements for fairness and requirements for process by mimicking the IDEA, the IEP process, but schools aren't required to. So it depends on where you live. Some states have put in place laws that say when students are going to be looking for a 504 plan, the school district should follow the rules of the IDEA, follow this more complex set of rules. Other schools say, no, we don't want to be bothered. We're just, the 504 process stands on its own. We'll have some shortcut to making sure that everything is fair. Sometimes it's statewide, sometimes it's district by district. Um, but a 504 plan does not require the parents to be seated at the table as decisions are made. And as far as I'm concerned, that means that if you have a choice between getting a 504 or, or an IEP, you go for the IEP because then you as the parent are definitely required to be part of the team that puts things in place. And you have no idea how important that is until you're sitting at the table listening to people talk about your child and feeling that only by talking from your parental perspective can you explain what's really going on? So I am always in favor of an IEP. Now, the IEP also has requirements for how quickly services must be provided to students. Under the federal law, from the moment that a parent consents to have their child evaluated to determine whether they fit within one of those classifications, 
and require special educational related services, that starts a clock ticking and within 60 days all of the evaluations of the student must be concluded so that the school can't let their feet drag on. 504 in some places will follow a similar model. In some places will set up a different set of rules. It's not specified within the law. As I remind you, 504 is a less rich law, less text, less rules, but that also can mean less rights for families. The one thing that both laws do have in common before I go on is that they require that the school district provide something which us lawyers and, and others in the field call FAPE, F-A-P-E, Free Appropriate Public Education. Basically, that means that what your child needs is what the school should provide. It's a standard describing the services that should be available to your child. Now, I know that we left many things open and it's still not clear in many of your minds. And hopefully as we look at the questions, as we talk about the questions, some of this can be clarified. But in the meantime, how do you get these services? Well, for a 504, start by talking to, and I'm assuming before you go for either service, that you've spoken to your child's classroom teacher, that you've determined in your own mind that it's not simply a matter of changing reading group or changing a child's seating or something like that. So we're talking here about situations where you've determined that these are not minor classroom tweaks, but there's a serious issue going on that needs to be addressed. And that you've either been told your child has a disability or you suspect your child has a disability. So that's our starting point. To apply for a 504 plan, if you don't believe your child's in need of special education services but does have a disability, every school is required to have a 504 team. Ask your classroom teacher, ask your school office, go on the school district or the school's individual website and search the term 504 forms. If you want to just get some idea of how different these can be, go if you search for the form for the Los Angeles School District, you get about 10, 12 pages of forms with input from classroom teachers and test scores and all sorts of things. Very, as I, I hate to keep using this word, but a very rich body of information that the 504 team will examine. If you go into the New York City Public Schools website, it's two pages. One for the parental request, what do you want, why do you want it, and one for the district to fill out and say this is what this child can have. So it's very, very variable. So 504 request is made to the 504 team, and there is, the law does say that there should be one in each school. If you can't find the 504 team, ask the principal or the teacher. If your child's issue is medication or medical, such as a child with mild attention who takes medication and needs to have a plan for that, try the school nurse as a starting point. And that's how that gets started. They will look at the documentation you submit. If they feel they need more documentation for the 504 determination, they have to provide the evaluation. In other words, they may say, well, we want to observe the child in the classroom. We want to have the child tested by a psychologist. The school district is responsible for that at their cost and expense. The 504 team meets. Some districts include parents. Some do not. Again, the rules for 504 are much looser. And they make a determination. A 504 plan is not required to be in writing, although almost all of them are. And it would provide what the child is going to be getting under the documentation that they have received. To apply for an IEP, the process, again, you should have determined whether these are ongoing academic issues, whether the child really needs something specialized. But once you've done that, you advise the school, and that can be the principal, the guidance counselor, they have an obligation to pass it along to the right person. Advise the school that you believe your child has a disability that requires special education services and you want to begin the IEP process. Then you will sign a consent to have your child evaluated. 
The school district is required to evaluate the child in all suspected areas of disabilities. So usually they do an IQ test and they do academic testing. They may do reading tests and math tests. If there's a medical condition, they'll have a physician examine the child or you will have your physician examine the child and submit a report. All the evaluations need to be done at the school's expense. You have a specific right to provide your own evaluations, which they must consider and may have to pay for. But once that determination is done, and as I said, the time frame is 60 days from the time you sign the consent till the time this whole evaluation process is finished, they must then convene a meeting of the IEP team. In some areas, it's called a Committee on Special Education. And that team or committee sits down. You are a required part of that team. You sit down at a table, you go over the results, and if the determination is made that your child falls within one of those classifications, then together, you put together a plan. Does this child need, for example, reading support? Is attention such a problem that the child needs to be in some sort of a, um, have an additional person in the classroom to help refocus their attention, that sort of thing. Those are all possibilities. Both laws also have requirements if the school is not meeting their obligation. There's a hearing process that you can go through under both laws, again, specified very distinctly in the IDEA, referred to tangentially in 504. Now, I've probably done more confusing than clarification right now, but I think it's a good time for me to stop and to take some of your questions, and hopefully things will become clearer as we do so. Oh, thank you, Susan. Let me start with a question that, that a number of people have posed here, which comes back to the IEP, the, the qualifications for an IEP. Um, many of the parents who have written in have been told point blank that ADHD is not on the list, does not qualify for an IEP. And I know that you mentioned other health impairments is the category under which ADHD children would, would, would be granted an IEP. Can you clarify how other health impairments works and what parents need to know about that in, to, in order to cope with a school which is arguing that ADHD is not on the list of IEP you know, criteria. Okay. In fact, I anticipated this very question. <laughs> and I am going to read to you from the federal IDEA regulations. For those of you who don't have the blessing of a legal <laughs> law school career, the, there's a law. The laws are written out. And then the, the sort of the details of the law are set out in regulations. If you're good with search engines, you can simple, simply search um, federal IDEA regulations, not the law itself. And it says the following under the definition section. Other health impairment means having limited strength, vitality, or alertness, including a heightened alertness to environmental stimuli, and that's your attention that results in limited alertness with respect to the educational environment that is due to chronic or acute health problems such as asthma, attention deficit disorder, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and it and goes on to say other things, and then it, and adversely affects a child's educational performance. So it is very specifically set out in the regulations that implement the IDEA, that attention deficit disorder or attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder absolutely fall within other health impairment, OHI. The distinction between a student for whom an IEP is appropriate and a student for whom the uh, 504 is appropriate generally falls in the air in that very last line that adversely affects a child's educational performance. Obviously having an attention problem is going to affect your performance. If it's very minor, a 504 is fine. If it's really a serious issue, then generally an IEP would be more appropriate. It's time to just insert one other thing. There's a term called comorbidities 
what that means are two things, two conditions that occur together. And attention and learning problems are frequently comorbid conditions. So a very high achieving student who has attention difficulties is doing relatively well but needs extended time on her examinations, for example, which is a very, very common 504 accommodation, would probably do fine with 504. A student who's got attention and some learning issues and is really starting to struggle a little should be having an IEP. I hope that clarifies. Okay, so so if if parents are told point blank that ADHD does not qualify them to receive an IEP, what they need to do, it sounds like from what you're saying, is the school is, is wrong when they're told that. Right, but it also sounds like they need to document that this ADHD is adversely affecting their ability to learn. It's, is that it's correct? It's really, you know, if you think about, I mean, if if you think about it as a continuum, the more serious the ADHD is. And the more the student's ability to succeed academically are impacted, the more likely the school is to provide IDEA services. What I frequently tell parents is this. It, it, there's another issue behind this also. Schools do get some federal funding for IEP services, but they're also more accountable. They actually, there are state and federal reviews of... How many children are being referred for special education? Are they discriminating against children of color or by gender for special education services? Schools are really don't like people looking at what they're doing. They would just as soon be left alone to do their 504 plans privately. So what I will suggest often to parents whose child has a documented attention issue, but the school is balking, is tell them, fine, let's start with a 504, but if that doesn't work, I am going to seek an IEP. And if you won't give me an IEP, I will file for a hearing. That's the word of art to use, moms and dads. You tell them you're going to file for a hearing. That's the appeals process. They have to bring in their lawyer, you have to bring in your lawyer, and you're going to argue with them. Not fun, not always successful, but it often gets their attention. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that many of the folks who are writing in that their school is just point blank refusing to address their issue are going to have to use those magic words um, that you just Mag mentioned. Yeah, magic <laughs> okay. words are important. And I think that what parents need to realize, and I, I think we had a slide on this, these are not favors the school is doing for you. These are rights to which your child's entitled. Now, it may be that your child's issues, while they seem of concern to you, the school may be correct that they don't fall within the ambit of these laws. It's possible. But chances are you as the parent are correct and the school is being difficult. I mean, it's, it's just the way it tends to fall out. Right. So you need to, there's no harm. You can move from a 504 to an IEP. So you can move from the smaller law to the bigger law, as I like to look at it. And if you think about a big circle, every student who has an IEP would also qualify for 504, but every student who qualifies for 504 can't qualify for an IEP. So what you need to do is be, be a little flexible and be willing to say, all right, let's see if you can meet my child's needs with a 504 plan. I understand that you're not as accountable for that. I understand that you consider it sort of special ed light, which it really isn't, but I'm going to give it six months. I'm not going to waste the school year. You have to give it a reasonable period of time, at which point I'm going to come back and ask for an IEP because I believe that my child needs more than you're willing to give under a 504. So requesting a hearing if necessary and and, and having an attorney, right, on your side. Um, an attorney, some people prefer to work with an advocate. There's a good advocate. national organization, copaa.org, Council of Parent Attorneys and Advocates, national nonprofit, has a find an attorney or advocate list by region, I believe, somewhere on its website. Um, these are people who are pretty dedicated and pretty knowledgeable 
Um, you can also ask around. There's many school districts have a special education PTA, a SEPTA, and the people in that SEPTA have been through this system. Sometimes right. you just need an advocate within the school district, a teacher, a, a guidance counselor who will help you through the system. You okay. certainly don't always need an attorney. Uh, I mean, I've got a bias in favor of that, but I won't go to an IEP meeting because it's like bringing a gun to a knife fight. You just, they get very nervous when lawyers show up. So, so you, so you, right, you might be better off starting out with an advocate or, you know. Or, for, you know, a knowledgeable or, friend, somebody who's right. going to help you. There are also places that parents can go to educate themselves. One good resource is the Rights Law website, W-R-I-G-H-T-S-L-A-W dot com. Pete Wright is an attorney with dyslexia, and he has books and seminars. I mean, it's a commercial site, but it'll, it's got a, and it's not so well organized. But it's, once you can get into it, it's got a lot of information about how to get started how do you go from the, the sense of frustration to understand what it is you need to know? There are classes parents can take. Um, there are talks given all the time. The talks that Attitude gives are, are very helpful. Um, there's a, I write a column for the Attitude magazine, Your Legal Rights, which deals with some of these issues. And um, that also I, has an opportunity for questions. Yeah, let me support. Let me just support the Rights Law website. It really is very helpful. I posted the link. I hope you can all see it. It's w r i g h t s l a w dot com. I want to clarify one thing, Susan, if you would. A number of people have children in private school, and they're asking both about private school and also about college. Um, okay. Whether an IEP or a 504 applies in private school and or in college. Okay, very simple. First of all, let's look at private school K through 12. Only the IDEA IEP applies there. 504 does not. Okay, very simple. However, there is no IEP in college. The IDEA comes to an end. I mean, I, I was joking with you before, Susan. I give a talk set called There's No IEP in College. Right. There, the laws that apply in college are the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504. 504 tends to be a chameleon law. The section that we've been talking about is specifically for students in preschool, elementary school, and high school. There's a separate section for students in post-secondary education. There's a separate section for people out in the workplace. And it looks more like the Americans with Disabilities Act. And by the way, the Americans with Disabilities Act, just to confuse us all a little further, applies to every single one of us. The only place that doesn't apply is in private religious settings. So if your child goes to a private school, a private religious school, that doesn't apply. So the, if you look at the in terms of the breadth of the laws, the ADA really applies to all of us in every situation. But the okay. 504 is only those places that take federal funding, so that's many colleges but not all of them. Um, but the IEDA, the IEP law, does not apply in college. Okay. Um, question here, does the parent have to provide a documented disability to request the 504? I know that in the IEP situation. No, Okay. Many times parents do, because if you're going for a 504 based, for example, on an attention deficit disorder, you would have taken your child to a, a, some sort of a physician who would have examined your child, made this determination, and you can have a letter from the physician in which you submit with your 504 request. However, if you are not in a position to do that or you choose not to do that, the responsibility is on the school to uh, evaluate your child for the suspected disability. If you're able to give them documentation, often schools don't need anything more. Under the 504, under IDEA, for example, my office, my 
office does extensive educational evaluations. The kids are here for two days plus. We work with psychologists and teachers and physicians, and we come out with like a 40-something page report. When parents decide to submit that to their school, I tell them all the time, I said, look, your school's going to probably want to do some of their own testing. Don't argue with them. Just let them do it. So the, and the IDEA specifies very broadly what has to be tested and, and gives all sorts of examples and, and scientifically proven research for this kind of testing. Much deeper requirements. 504, if, you, if your kid's doc says that the kid has a problem with attention, submit that letterhead documentation to the school or have the physician fill out the form that the school district may have on their website or that you pick up from the school, and that's usually sufficient. But if not, then the school will do the evaluation. But I'm not sure okay. I'd want to rely on them if I didn't have to. Right. Um, it, we discussed the fact that if an IEP is, is, is not meeting your child's needs, you should file for um, request a hearing. Similarly, what about the 504? Many people are saying that, that you know, they're not getting the help that they need through the 504. Okay. What recourse do they have in that case? They, the law that Section 504 says that districts and schools must put in place procedures for parents who are not satisfied with the 504 plan, that following the procedures of the IDEA is one way of meeting this requirement. So you will have districts that have the same process so that the state hearing officer, for example, or the independent hearing officer, whatever it's called in your area, that hears IDEA complaints will also hear 504 complaints. The other place you can file, if, if it seems that you're not getting heard, that the other place you can file is with the Office of Civil Rights for the United States Department of Education. So when you get a 504 plan, there should be a statement of due process rights that parents get. You definitely get it with the IDEA. You should probably would be getting it with the 504 plan because they must put something in place. And that would lay out the procedures for appeal. And that's basically what you're doing. Okay. Uh, a couple of people have asked about places where they can find language to use for the services. And to that, I just want to say that not only does rights law have that, but we also have several downloadable booklets. Go to attitudemag.com downloads. And there are booklets that have sample letters in them to request an evaluation and to right. request um, services. So you can find sample letters. They're very useful because it does seem overwhelming when you have to sort of imagine what it is you're going to say to your child's school. Um, so find sample letters on our site, on Learning Disabilities Association, on Rights Law, and adapt those to your child's situation. Um, those are all good resources, yes. Yeah, yeah. Very common, there are five or six people here who say that their child's grades are not suffering, although their child has tremendous stress, has been diagnosed with ADHD or dyslexia, but their grades are still holding up and therefore the school is refusing um, any assistance. Well, if what? they're refusing any assistance, there's a, that's a different issue than if they're refusing an IEP. Let's go take a look again at the requirements for an IEP are that the child has the disability and therefore require special education services. And getting good grades is one indication that education is not, is not being impacted, although other things are going on. So to those parents, I would say that you might want to try addressing your child's issues first with a 504 plan. That could cover anxiety. That can, for example, if your child is, gets, is is so anxious because of testing, then one thing might be extended time, being tested in a quiet location separately from other students, so if they finish more quickly, your child does freak out. Those are the kinds of things that can be applied under a 504 plan, even if your child doesn't have that second piece of the 
IDEA IEP requirement, which is meeting special education services. Sometimes it's a very close call between the two laws, and I'm not sure that anybody can draw a distinct line right down the middle and say these kids fall within one and these kids fall within the other. Okay. Um, a question about other ser uh, the kinds of services. So some, some parents' children need speech therapy or other kinds of occupational therapy, or they may have executive function problems, need organization help. Do these services fall under IEP or 504? Yes, both. So that your child can get occupational therapy under either, um, speech therapy under either, Definitely both available because those, what they call related services, the organizational help, the speech therapy, the physical therapy, the occupational therapy, are both provided for under both laws. So it depends what else is going on. Okay. But there's no reason why those other services shouldn't be part of the 504 plan or the IEP That's plan. correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, do you have any advice for parents going into the IEP meeting? A couple of people have said that they're, you know, not sure what they should take to the meeting. They're anxious about, about going into the meeting um, and feel like the school's already made up its mind about what, it's gonna, what services they'll, uh, they'll be offering or not offering. Okay. What the parents should bring in, first of all, a smile, a notepad, and if you are comfortable doing this, a tray of cookies. <laughs> because you're going to catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Secondly, bring somebody with you, someone who is not going to get emotional, who can take notes. The first thing you do when you get into the meeting, they will be passing around an attendance sheet to create a record of who was there. The first thing you say as a parent I would need a copy of that sheet, please, and then you actually look at it and see whose name isn't legible and ask them to spell it for you, or you can pass around your own attendance sheet. That sends a very clear signal that you have been counseled that if this matter has to go to a hearing, that one of the things that's going to be important is who is there. So you're sort of stating, you know, you're, you're standing up straight, you're saying, I know my rights, and all you're doing is taking attendance or asking for a copy of their attendance sheet, yet it sends a very strong signal of your level of knowledge and expertise. Secondly, you should have a checklist with you because we I have cried at IEP meetings. I'm a mom of a kid with issues too. And I have to tell you, I used to cry regularly. Um, and I was a trained negotiator. So this, is, <laughs> this is tough for parents. This is not easy stuff. So what you do is you take a big yellow pad or a white pad, whatever your color preference is, and you write down, like you would be going to the grocery store, what is it that you want to address? How often, what services do you want? How often? Are there problems with anything in particular, a teacher, another student? How is the school going to let you know how Johnny is doing? How often are they going to get back to you? Is there a way to find out what his homework is supposed to be so that you're not sitting there pulling your hair out? I mean, the lists are extensive, and those websites that you referred to before will have some ideas for you of things you can ask for, but you need to make your shopping list so that you can tick off each item so you don't forget things. It's possible to amend a, an IEP without a meeting. You also need to have somebody who's going to take careful notes. Mrs. Smith says thus and such. Mr. Jones says thus and such because you're going to forget. I wouldn't go in, some, you, there's a right to tape record things. I, I wouldn't get involved in that. It's just going to get everybody's back up. Assume that the school wants to do right until proven otherwise. Ask questions. Don't sign anything. You have to consent to services. So eventually you're going to have to sign a document consenting to an IEP with services if you want your child to get services, but there's no requirement that you sign on the spot. If things are truly, truly outrageous, you can always say, you know, this is really of concern to me. I really hoped we could work things out well. I'd hate to have to take this matter to a hearing. Again, you're showing your knowledge level. 
But I would only, to me, that's, you know, sort of the nuclear option. You don't do that unless things are absolutely a disaster. Instead, you, you assume that the school is trying to help, let them know that you're assuming that they want the best, and often that will help facilitate the mood of the meeting. Okay. That seems like good advice. I'll start out on the right note if, and only escalate if you really need to. Um, can you give some, I know that there's a just, lot well, of... Let me just interrupt yeah. with one thing. If your child is old enough and is emotionally able to do this, I urge you to bring your child to his or her IEP meeting. Because when they get out of high school, they're going to have to deal with their own issues, number one. Number two, if, for example, a, a eighth grader is having difficulty with a teacher, it's important to explain why things are problematic. Now, kids don't want to go to IEP meetings, and sometimes it can be upsetting. But even if the child just comes in, well, let's bring Johnny in just to explain what goes on in math. Johnny comes in, he says his piece, everybody's usually very respectful to Johnny because they don't want to upset him. Johnny goes out and then the meeting continues. It's a very effective way to make a point. Okay. So it seems like a really good idea. And, and, and to your point about life after high school, uh, kids do have to advocate for themselves in college. Absolutely. So the sooner the better, right? Um, just to come back to the other planning um, organization behavior, people are asking whether behavior problems can be addressed under 504 or IEP. Yes, absolutely, under either law. It depends on what the cause of the behavior issues are. I mean, a child who's emotionally disturbed, obviously that's a category under the IDEA. That child would need one kind of um, IEP, but behavioral plans are, should be part of any IEP or 504 where they might be relevant. So if a kid is acting out in school because his attention issues aren't under control, the, there should be a plan in the 504 plan to address that. And furthermore, if your child gets into trouble and does not have an appropriate behavioral plan, that can be a partial defense if the school wishes to suspend them. That's a, a whole subject for another day. But just right. be mindful of the fact that if there's not an appropriate behavior plan in place, now a lot of kids don't need one, but if your kid does and the school hasn't put one in place, that's a problem that the school hasn't addressed, and it's their problem to fix. Okay. Can you, I know that this, avail, this information is out, on, out there on lots of websites, but can you just tick off some of the uh, services that you've seen be most effective for children with ADHD and executive function disorder? You mentioned extra time on tests. And extra time is the sort of the, really the starting right. point. So it would be additional time on tests. Usually schools will not balk at giving you one and a half the standard time. Two times the standard time is very unusual. And by the way, that goes for the uh, SAT, ACT people as well. Right. Just in passing, those organizations are not governed by the IDEA. They're governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act, even though they deal with kids in the K through 12 spectrum. So, again, a subject for another day. But um, so extended time taking tests in a quiet location, note-taking, having either, and there's a ver bunch of variations on this. One would be the teacher providing notes. One would be having a note-taking buddy. Usually it's the girl with the best handwriting. <laughs> um, and, and I say girl <laughs> as the mother of right. three sons. Um, and some sort of a homework mechanism because often, you know, the work, the work doesn't come home. The work doesn't go back to school. Nobody knows what the assignment is. Um, you know, these are some of the things that happen with these kids. At least that's what happened at my house. So there, you have to sort of break down the day. What goes on? The teacher needs to provide the notes so that the information gone on that has gone on during the day is provided to the child. The child and the parent need to have mechanisms for knowing what the assignment is. So there needs to be some sort of a log that's checked off. 
or um, a separate assignment sheet, a checklist of what the child needs to take home. So that, I mean, this can be part of a 504 plan. Johnny needs to have a checklist at his desk for items to take home, and Mrs. Smith needs to review it with him each day. Um, those are some of the things that would be helpful. It's not, look, schools don't provide executive functioning coaches. I have one that works in the same suite as I do. This is a woman with a PhD who sees students on a, you know, a regular basis. It's a very expensive kind of service, and schools aren't going to do it, but they can buddy kids up with each other. They can come up with tools and tricks. There are also electronic devices that parents can get. Um, on the Yellen Center website, which is yellencenter.com, we have a, a, there's a listing across the top for a blog. I write a blog. One of our learning specialists, who's a master level teacher, also writes the blog. And she's a real tech lady. Mine are more down-to-earth kinds of things. But there are some fabulous suggestions for technical devices, um, websites, apps to help kids. There are also, if you, there's a searchable feature. So you can search IDEA Section 504. And some of, I was just looking at that stuff before we began this webinar. And it go, there's numerous blogs that talk about these laws and strategies and apps, and that's another resource that you can use. That's like a really good idea, yeah. Um, finding out something. We have like 700 blogs, so don't get, don't get <laughs> writing in know, few years. Right, right. Clarification request on, um, you mentioned, I think, private religious schools. Um, right. Do they not, they do not follow, have to follow IEP and 504 All laws? Right. Let me just go through this again. IEPs under the IDEA are only public schools. 504 applies only to, excuse me, IEP, IDEA is only through 12th grade but applies to all students. It includes homeschooled students. It includes students in private schools. Now, the funding stream is different for private schools, so the services may differ a little. But the IDEA IEP is for every student K through 12 or pre-K through 12. 504 only applies to public entities that get federal money, so it will not apply to private schools. The ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, applies to everybody from birth through death, so there's no age limits. And it applies to private entities as well, but not to private religious entities. I hope I haven't made it more confusing. Okay. <laughs> Want me to do that one more time? Yeah, try it again. Yep. Okay. IDEA, which gives you your IEP, is time limited, so it's pre-K through high school graduation. It applies to every student in that range, whether they're homeschooled, private schooled, public schooled including kids in a private religious school, okay? 504 comes out of a law that bans discrimination in dealings with the federal government. So that only applies to entities, to public entities that get federal funding, which means it in does not include private schools that don't get federal funding, whether they're parochial or just non-denominational. It doesn't include any private schools at all. The IDEA, which applies from birth through death, is, excuse me, the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, too many acronyms for me today. The Americans with Disabilities Act applies to public and private schools, but does not apply to private religious schools. So Saint whatever, you will not get, does not have to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Okay, that's, yeah, that's very helpful. Um, is there any circumstance under which a child would have both an IEP and a 504? A couple of people have asked that. The practical question. answer is no. No, right. Although a child would, could qualify for both, the 504 specifically says that providing services under an IEP is 
fulfilling any obligations under 504. So you don't have both. If you have an IEP, you're entitled to everything you'd get under 504 and then some. Right. So you don't right. want those. By the okay. way, both laws require that they be revisited annually. So you'd have an annual review of your IEP. You'd have an annual meeting of the 504 team um, updating any necessary documentation under IDEA. It must, you must be reevaluated every three years. A triennial review, it's called. So the 504 at each stage, because that's another question that's come up, people whose children have had accommodations, have done well with the result, and are now facing a school that's saying, well, your child's doing well, we don't see the need to continue the accommodations. So that's a conversation that happens each year? It's a conversation um, that happens each year. But first of all, schools cannot require families to put a kid on medication or take a kid off of medication. So sometimes what will happen is a child will have an attention difficulty, the child will go on medication, be doing much better, and then the school says, well, he doesn't need the accommodation. You know, then of course the kid will have to go off of the medication because maybe there are side effects, and then he'll need the accommodation again. So I would push pretty hard to keep the accommodation in place. So once you, once you... Um, but it's possible that they could remove it if they didn't feel that the child still needed it. Right. And once you are, uh, no longer have an IEP, this is a question from someone, I was told once, once her, her daughter tested, quote, out of IEP that she could not requalify. Is that correct? Absolutely not. First of all, okay. there's no such thing as testing out of. If a child has an IEP, they have a disability, and it's possible that the disability will be remediated to the point where the student no longer needs special education or related services. However, if the student, I mean, at each grade, the challenges that a student faces are, are expanded. So it's highly unlikely for its child to test out. But if that, the school were to claim that that was the case, then as soon as the parents felt that the child was floundering again, they should go right back in and say, time to retest because we believe Johnny needs that IEP. Okay. So the same thing, that, the same issues that hold when you think your child needs an IEP, request an evaluation. Right. Right. Okay. Right. I mean, I think a sticky point for a number of folks here is not knowing whether they're supposed to come into the meeting knowing what accommodations and what services to ask for or whether they should expect the school to come up with that. So specifically, I one person says... I think the answer is, is both. Both, okay. The school is going to have in its mind, based on its work with your child and with other children, a list of things that they're comfortable giving that they've given before, that have worked with others, that they feel might work with your child. But only you as a parent know your child in such depth. And therefore, you as a parent will also, should also have expectations of what it is that your child needs. If those are in full conformity, that's great. If not, it's a conversation to be had. And that's why I like the IEP process where the parent is a mandated member of the team. So right, the parent right. can talk about that and say, well, I know that you're saying he doesn't need this, but we have found thus and such happens. And those are the things that make for an interactive good meeting. And a lot of IEP meetings are good meetings. It's not always adversarial. It's just that you, you, know, you sort of hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Right, right. Here's an interesting question from Dan. Um, he says his child has ADHD, but also depression. He's preparing for a 504 meeting in a few weeks. Is there anything specific that he should do or expect around the issue of his child's emotional um, depression, anxiety? Dan, I would question whether you might, first of all, you might want to think about whether your child is would be better off under an IEP. You certainly don't want your child to be, the, the categories are a little problematic because you don't want emotional disturbance as a category, but you certainly could 
ask, say that your child has an other health impairment. Um, but I'm wondering whether or not the depression, for example, is the child on medication for the depression? Is the child receiving um, psychological services? And if so, through the school, should the teachers be monitoring the child for behaviors which could be dangerous that flow from the depression? So these are things that can be in a 504 plan, but you may, if you feel that that's not rich enough or if your school's not letting you participate, then perhaps what you want to do is move on to the IEP process. You can certainly get what you need from 504, and that might be the best way to start. Okay. okay. Um, Susan, can you address the RTI process, response to intervention? Okay. The latest revision, which was in 2009, of the IDEA changed what schools could do, and I stress could because they're not all taking advantage of this. It used to be that everybody used something that was called the discrepancy model. Your child had an ability level, generally the school would measure it by an IQ test, and the child had a performance level based on the grades, so that if a very bright child with a high IQ was getting poor grades, they would assume that there is a learning problem. But if a child of average ability was getting average or slightly below average grades, they wouldn't be so quick to assume a learning problem and might balk at giving a child an IEP. What, and, and some states, New Jersey is the exception I deal with all the time, even though I'm here in New York, many of our families come from New Jersey. New Jersey still follows that model. So that's called the discrepancy model. What the new version of the IDEA put in place was something called Response to Intervention, RTI, which set out a process so that if a child is struggling, the school would have a, an RTI procedure. They would try certain things, and only at about the third or fourth level of these variations on how's the student doing, and if, if, if basic remediation didn't work and a higher level of remediation didn't work and the student was still struggling, then and only then would it be obvious that this child had a learning problem because they weren't responding to normal classroom interventions. So the goal was to cut down on the number of kids who were referred for special education services while making sure that the classroom teacher really looked carefully at what was going on with the child's learning. And that's what RTI is. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm afraid we have to close. Susan, do you have any final comments before we end this? I know there's, we could go on for another hour. It's been so helpful. And, it's, it's, and I apologize if because of the breadth of information, if I haven't been clear, I do want to assure parents that the system is set up to work and to help. That doesn't mean it always does, but they need to um, just put one foot in front of the other, take deep breaths. You, if you do cry at your meeting, you won't be the first parent to do so. And when I talk, when, I've, when my son was younger, he's now in his early 20s, and I would say to him, what am I going to do with you? He gave me the best advice of all. He said, Ma, keep me and love me. And that's the advice. <laughs> Great advice. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you, You're everyone, for, for attending our webinar. And good luck with those meetings. You can do it. Thanks. Bye, everyone. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.